Let's say you've decided to complete a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. The pieces start out scrambled in the box, but by taking it one piece at a time, eventually you'll finish your puzzle masterpiece. In chemistry, coming up with the products and chemical reactions can often feel like we're doing a puzzle. We fit substances together in a partial picture and predict what the final outcome will look like. And we don't need to be intimidated with chemistry either. We'll take it one piece at a time and look for patterns until we have our results. We've already covered the various kinds of chemical reactions, and today we're gonna to take it one step further using these classic types to help us determine what our product should be when we don't have the full chemical reaction. Hi, I'm Will Komar, and welcome back to Study Hall Chemistry, presented by Arizona State University and Crash Course. Let's dive in. Predicting products sounds like we'll be doing a lot of guesswork or using psychic powers, but in reality, we'll be problem solving by using what we already know about each type of reaction and the substances involved to get our answer. The best way to predict the products of reactions is by following these six steps. One, write out our known reactants. Two, determine which reaction type we're working with. Three, use that information to make an educated guess for what the products could be. Four. Consult the periodic table to find out a charge or an element's grouping. Five, use the crossover rule to create the proper subscripts if we're working with ions. And finally, six, balance the reaction to make sure we haven't missed anything. Let's begin with synthesis reactions, which synthesize or bring together multiple substances into one combined substance, like a marriage. Our reactants here could either be elements or compounds. We'll walk through both situations. First up, Combination of elements. Let's use a reaction between solid aluminum and chlorine gas as an example. First, we'd write out our elements, aluminum and chlorine, remembering that chlorine is diatomic. Second, we can identify this as a synthesis reaction since the reactants are two single elements. Third, we'll make an educated guess about the product. We know we're combining reactants, so let's write out aluminum chloride to start, but something still doesn't feel right. We need to go to step four, consulting the periodic table of the elements. If we find aluminum on the table, we see that it has a charge of plus three. Similarly, chlorine has a charge of minus one. Now we can do step five, employing the crossover rule. That's when the reactant's ion charges switch places and become subscripts in the product. Another way of saying this is that we need three chloride anions or negative ions to balance out one aluminum cation or positive ion. And the same has to be true for the product side. Now we have our unbalanced but final written out reaction. And as we covered last time, the next step in our list would be to balance it out and done. Next, we can talk about combining compounds. The common ones we'll see often have some overlap with acids and bases, but the general format of two substances becoming one remains the same throughout. We might have the combination of water with an acid oxide, also known as an acid anhydride, which is an acidic substance formed by removing water. Think of it as though it's been dried out, like astronaut food or raisins. Using our steps, we ID this as a synthesis reaction. Then when we look at the reactants, we can pretty confidently guess that adding water back into an acidic anhydride makes it an acid again. Along those same lines, a synthesis reaction combining a basic oxide or a basic anhydride with water would form a base as the product. Both acid and base cases like these are simple, so we don't need the other steps, unless we want to confirm we've balanced correctly or something. We could also put our knowledge of acids and bases together and figure out what happens if we combine a basic oxide with an acidic oxide. We only need steps one and two to predict the product here. We write out our anhydrous reactants and identify this as an acid-base reaction, just minus the water. So we already know what the expected product is, so, now that we've covered synthesis reactions, let's predict some products for decomposition reactions. We can identify these more easily because they begin with only one reactant. Sometimes, decomposition reactions are pretty straightforward. Once we identify the reaction type, we already know what the products will be. They just separate into their respective elements. But sometimes, it can be trickier, and we might need to rely on our knowledge of other reaction types, like acid-base ones. If we were to reverse our previous example, where we combined an acidic oxide with water to create an acid, we'd be decomposing an acid. The products would then be an acidic oxide and water. Step three, accomplished. We can use the same rule of thumb for base decompositions whose products would be a basic oxide and water. Knowing a puzzle piece of certain traits can give us a hint as to where it needs to end up. 
We use the same idea for decomposition reactions. Understanding the elements that make up the reactant will give us a clue as to what should be on the other side. Carbonates will logically produce carbon dioxide, for instance. Similarly, if we had a decomposition reaction of a substance with some sort of metal cation, like potassium or lithium, and an anion like chlorate or carbonate, we can expect that the products would be the metal cation bonded to one of the anion atoms since their charges attract. The other product would be whatever's left after that. Let's move on to single and double displacement reactions. We compared single displacement to a love triangle back when we first learned about it because one of the substances loses its partner while the other gains it in the products. If we apply this knowledge to an example, let's see if we can determine what the products should be. For example, take iron reacting with copper 2 nitrate. Let's follow step one and write it out and use step two to recognize that A plus BC becomes AC plus B pattern, making it in a single displacement reaction. That takes us to step three, predicting that iron will gain whatever copper nitrate loses, but now we need some more info. Let's get some help from test two. To find out which part of copper nitrate is leaving it for iron, we can use steps four, consulting the periodic table, or five, using the crossover rule to find out their charges. Our copper cation has a positive two charge and our nitrate anion has a negative one charge. We can also see that iron has a charge of positive two. Cations and anions change place in single displacement reactions. And it's important to note here that no two cations or anions will ever end up together. Like with magnets, opposites attract. And in this case, that's very true. So we can use this knowledge to confirm our products will have the iron cation paired with the negative nitrate polyatomic ion, leaving copper on its own. One more secret the periodic table can give to us in step four is the activity of elements. If we consult the periodic table again, we can see that iron is a metal. Metals are increasingly likely to react or are active the further left on the periodic table they are, as well as the further down the column they are. If we apply this principle to iron and copper, iron is more active than copper and can steal the nitrate during the reaction. Now that all our puzzle pieces have come together, we can confidently write out the products of this reaction, iron two nitrate and copper metal. A quick check that is balanced and we're all good. Metals aren't the only class of elements to have fun tricks up their sleeves. The group of elements known as halogens also have their own activity trend which we can view in an activity series table. This time, the more reactive halogens are at the top, decreasing in tendency to react as we go down the column. Let's say we have a reaction between chlorine gas and sodium bromide. According to the halogen column on the periodic table, chlorine is more reactive than bromine. So we can deduce that the chlorine is going to replace it as sodium's significant other in the product. Sure enough, the full reaction produces sodium chloride and diatomic bromine. As we continue learning about predicting products, it might be helpful to print out a copy of a periodic table to draw on and make notes about activity and charges. Chemistry is a road best walked with a map, and the periodic table is a valuable guide that will make this journey a lot easier. Moving on to double displacement reactions. At their core, these reactions are just a simple switch of cation and anion partners. If the reactants of step one and two tell us where their partners are now, we will already know where they'll end up in step three by a process of elimination. Let's work a quick example with aqueous silver nitrate and aqueous sodium chloride. We start with step one, writing out the chemical formula of the reactants. We can recognize this reaction has two compounds, so we're dealing with double displacement. Now we should predict the products. If we write this out with separate ions, we can figure out the products by switching their components according to charge and come up with silver chloride and sodium nitrate. Great, it's already balanced and does not need any coefficients. Step six done. We should also note that silver chloride forms a solid within the sodium nitrate, which makes this not only double displacement, but also a precipitate reaction. As with many reaction types, there's some overlap between double displacement precipitation and acid-based reactions. And there's one last reaction type we haven't explored, so let's talk a little bit about the products of combustion reactions. A rule of thumb for identifying these is that the reactant, often a combination of hydrogen and carbon, combines with atmospheric oxygen. We know we'll get water as one of the products, but oxygen is going to stick to the other element, producing an oxide as the other product. For example, when the hydrocarbons methane or kerosene combust, their structures both react similarly with oxygen, 
and gaseous carbon dioxide and water are the products. We often see reactants and combustion reactions referred to as fuels when they take the form of a hydrocarbon. While reactants containing carbon are more common, they're not the only kind we'll see in combustion reactions. Some others might be sulfur or nitrogen, which then produce sulfur dioxide or nitrogen dioxide. We don't just predict products for fun or because it's our homework. There are real-world impacts of reactions like these. For example, many products of combustion are toxic gases and are the result of burning fuels with impurities. They can bring harm to the environment in the form of carbon monoxide poisoning, acid rain, and poor air quality. We might already know this is a serious impact of pollution, but chemistry provides a needed context of how we got to this point. This is part of the reason understanding the products of any reaction is one of the foundations of chemistry. We as people are in charge of understanding the hazardous or damaging effects certain reactions can cause, and for minimizing those effects where possible. Recognizing what reactions produce before we initiate them, whether it's a synthesis, decomposition, single or double displacement, or combustion reaction, is a valuable tool we can use to champion for safety in the lab and in the environment. Next time on Study Hall Chemistry, we'll talk about solubility as well as explore the charged atmosphere of electrolytes. Thanks for watching Study Hall Chemistry, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexity. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us here in Study Hall, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about ASU and the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. See y'all next time.